Hey everybody, I wanted to respond specifically to a day nine comment where I talked about the MedCram video and the saturated fat and the meat thing. I did a video on that day nine and I did a follow-up video day 10. In the day nine video, the person is asking for the links to the research. I put the links to the research in the description of that day nine video. It is very long, some of it, but I said that I was going to be objective and put debates in there, not just one side of the story. I encouraged everybody to listen. In both those videos I made, day nine and day 10, I made very specific points, which I will revisit here. <clears throat> but the person sort of went on to say that they're not convinced and then proceeds to tell me how science works, which is pretty funny. But let me go a little bit deeper into this and let me show you guys. First of all, you have two doctors debating on Joe Rogan about this exact topic and it goes on for three hours and 40 minutes. You can listen to that, but I'm going to kind of pull pieces from that debate. You can start the, the debate at about an hour and 58 minutes and just listen for 30 minutes. I'm gonna pick a few things out in that debate for, for your example of how much more complicated this actually is and how we keep missing the point. We keep missing the point. My main point in my two videos was, if you're going to remove saturated fat from the diet, you're going to have to get your calories somewhere else, right? So people don't just magically stop being hungry. In, in fact, part of the problem here, the reason why people feel hungry is hormonal. It's called ghrelin. It's, it's called insulin resistance, all of which we talked about. Nevertheless, you take saturated fat out of the diet. Now they have to replace those calories with something else. Well, fat happens to be very calorie dense, nine calories per gram. You have polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, and saturated fat. Let's just assume people are getting a third of each. And we'll talk about where people are getting their saturated fat and polyunsaturated fat in a minute. And is that even good for you? meaning the polyunsaturated fats. What are you going to replace it with? My point is that the average person is going to replace that with more refined carbs. And if you listen to the Joe Rogan argument, you hear Chris Kresser talking about how bad it is when you put in sugar and refined carbs in the context of a high saturated fat diet, that that's where the real problem comes in. You go back to my main point, in day nine, which was sugar. Sugar is the main thing that we need to you know, hone in on here and start to eliminate. Some people, I said specifically in the second video, day 10, and I mentioned it briefly in day nine, that there are very specific genetic polymorphisms that some people have when it comes to fat metabolism. I'll get to that in a minute as well, because none of that is covered in the Chris Kresser debate. Meaning, what do, what do we mean by um, these, poly, these uh, polymorphisms? What's going on there? And then is there an even larger looming problem here when it comes to the absorption of certain fats? The answer is yes, and, and they don't go into any of that either. So, my biggest point was, do away with the refined carbs, do away with the sugar. Instead... I'd rather you have the saturated fat than the refined carbs and sugar. I also said very specifically, it matters where the saturated fat comes from. Think about this. Ask yourself this. Are, is extra virgin olive oil good for you? Are avocados good for you? Is very dark chocolate good for you? Is coconut oil good for you? All of these things we know have tremendous health benefits. They are also all forms of saturated fat. Now, extra virgin olive oil has about 15 to 20% saturated fat, but when you look at the Mediterranean diet, it is not uncommon in Greece and Italy. I mean, they put extra virgin olive oil on everything. So a one pint bottle, 16 ounces of extra virgin olive oil, um, is going to have 64 grams of fat in it, in most extra virgin olive oils. Now, one pint of olive oil, there are many people that will go through one pint in a week 
easily. And that's just from extra virgin olive oil. Now, would you rather be getting just, just objectively, just let's just leave, you know, all studies and everything aside. Just ask yourself objectively. Would you rather be getting your saturated fat from extra virgin olive oil, avocados, dark chocolate, egg yolks, coconut oil, these types of forms? Or would you rather be getting it from um, candies and junk food and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Big Macs and wash it down with a soda and a milkshake and, you know, crappy forms of dairy and cheeses? objectively which one just sounds because there's actually there is science to why that would be now and what would that be what would the science be well let's go back now to talking about meat specifically i said very specifically that meat the problem with meat when it's not organic the function of fat is to store toxins that's one of its main functions I have been telling people forever, when you buy organic meat, buy lean meat. Because the function of fat is to store toxins. When you heat it up, that the carcinogens become even more abundant. Okay, luckily we have genes to deal with carcinogens, but you don't want to keep smashing your body with carcinogens all day long, right? That's why a DMV employee that's you know, standing next to a uh, car exhaust all day isn't the greatest job in the world. Similarly, if you're smoking all day long, that's why it's not good for you. It, so when you cook steak or cook meat, try to be on the leaner side, make sure it's organic, again, because you're mitigating a lot of these toxins, but you're also mitigating a lot of these hormones that we know are put into animals in order to make them larger in shorter periods of time, specifically steroids. There are hormones that are specifically put into animals that we know make them grow larger. And that triggers, which Joel Kahn talks about, the IGF mTOR pathway, which we'll talk about in a minute. But th these are steroids that they're putting into them. <laughs> okay, so Joel Kahn makes the point about, well, you know, you don't want to be eating meat because you know, it triggers the mTOR pathway, Chris. Now, we'll talk about mTOR and IGF-1 in one second, but we've already talked about it in the past. We've talked about it in these videos, and I did an entire seminar just on mTOR, IGF-1 in the gym. But watch this. Just check this out. So if we know that things like extra virgin olive oil, avocados, dark chocolate, organic egg yolks, coconut oil, all these things are healthy forms of fat. And you could just Google anything you want on the benefits of these foods. They are abundant. They are profound. Do we want to get our saturated fat from non-organic animal, um, non-farm raised animals with all these hormones and antibiotics in them? Do we want to wash it down with Slurpees and milkshakes, which we know those sugars and refined carbs, you know, on a bun with crappy dairy? Um, we know that these refined carbs and these sugars add further context to problems in LDL particles and heart disease in the body. Again, that is referenced in the Joe Rogan experience by Chris Kresser about two hours in. And, and meaning it's, he gives you the reference to those studies. So it is about context in that regard. It is about the forms of saturated fat that we're eating. And Chris also breaks down specifically where the average American is getting their saturated fat from. It, you know, and he breaks it down from junk food. It's 33% junk food. It's 20% fast food. It's this, it's that. The context meaning where you are getting your saturated fat, the sources of saturated fat really, really matter. And what you're adding into the saturated fat, meaning with the saturated fat, also matter. So in the context of a highly refined carb, high sugar diet, it also matters what your genes are. So there are many genetic polymorphisms that map onto how well you metabolize fat. Now, you may not know what your genes are. You may not know 
Well, do I have those genes? If you did a 23andMe test, you would know because I would tell you, hey, look, saturated fat is probably not the greatest thing for you. Here's where I want you to get your sources of saturated fat and here's why, okay? But let's assume you don't know that. Here's what we do know. Remember the whole talk I gave on digestion? Remember the whole talk I gave about why people's digestion really sucks? Do you remember how I said one of the biggest problems we have is metabolizing fat and all of the reasons why? We don't chew our food, our stomach acid sucks, our gut motility is horrible. When we finally move the food from the stomach into the duodenum and the jejunum, where fat is actually broken down and emulsified by bile and pancreatic enzymes, specifically lipase, these, their functions are hampered terribly because bile comes from the gallbladder. And where does the gallbladder get its bile from? From the liver. Unhealthy livers, unhealthy gallbladders, for all of the reasons we talked about in the past, I can only cover specific topics in a short period of time, guys. Um, but Trust me, the average person's liver is unhealthy. The average person's gallbladder is unhealthy. That's why 750,000 plus gallbladders are removed in this country a year. The gallbladder can't do its job, meaning bile can't do its job, which is to emulsify fat. You have a liver problem, you got you fatty liver, which the average person does. You have a fatty pancreas too, meaning now the pancreatic signaling is messed up. Guess where insulin comes from? It comes from your pancreas. Guess why so many people have insulin, resistant, insulin resistance? It's a pancreas problem. Guess what else the pancreas does? It sends lipase. It sends enzymes to break down all kinds of foods, including lipase to help break down fat. This is another reason why we have a fat problem because we can't digest well. This is not talking about talked about in the Joe Rogan experience either with between... So in three and a half hours, they don't talk about any of that, but you hear, hear me talking about it. So the other thing that they don't talk about is, well, they, they talk about it, but Chris doesn't take advantage of this part of the debate, is Joel Kahn makes the argument, look, you know, these people in Okinawa, their LDL is 80. And, you know, he says, this is why I eat soy and tofu and blah, blah, blah. And, and what, ironically, he also uses mTOR as part of his argument. Just hear me out. mTOR is a pathway along with IGF-1. There are many pathways that signal for growth in the body. It absolutely maps onto what we would call quote unquote aging, but it's only because it's building things up very, very quickly. So you don't want to keep it on all of the time, but your body doesn't keep it on all the time, right? When you eat certain foods, it, it turns on and builds up. Now, there are a whole bunch of benefits to turning on IGF-1. Guess, what, guess where else you turn on these pathways? When you lift weights, when you go into a hot sauna, okay? You trigger mTOR pathways pretty much every time you eat. Now, some foods signal mTOR much higher, but specifically the branched chain amino acids and even more specifically is leucine. Leucine triggers mTOR most profoundly. Now, if you really want to learn about mTOR, you can l listen to Peter Atiyah's podcast and he interviews the, the most famous person in the world researching mTOR. Just go into Peter Atiyah's podcast and you'll see there's probably five or six uh, episodes where he talks specifically about mTOR with this person whose name is eluding me right now. But you can learn all about it and you can hear him talk specifically about leucine and being most consequential. Now, why does that matter? You know what food is almost highest in leucine of all? Tofu. It's, it's in the top five or six most dense um, amino acid, specifically branched chain amino acid, specifically leucine, triggers mTOR most profoundly. So does eating soy mitigate the mTOR pathway? 
So if both meat and soy trigger, have a lot of leucine and they both trigger mTOR, I don't understand Joel Kahn's argument here, okay? Here's, here's why you don't understand it either because we don't know everything that's going on here. We don't. And I'm trying to show you we don't know everything. What I am trying to show you is what we do know. What we do know is a problem is sugar. What we do know a problem is refined carbs. What we do know is a problem is you can't digest fat. What we do know is a problem is that we don't have um, proper insulin signaling in our body. We know a whole bunch of things for sure, but yet you're going to sit here and make a debate about saturated fat with me, which is fine. I, I love debating. I love talking about this stuff, but you're not hearing me. So hear this because I have more because now I also mentioned PUFAs, which are polyunsaturated fatty acids. So again, we can go back to saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat. Well, if saturated fat is so bad, which it isn't, and I hope you're beginning to understand what actually is the problem here. Now, in some people, they may have certain genetics that they need to watch how much saturated fat they eat. Okay? Some. And if they do, like I said, I would recommend get your saturated fat from these sources. And here's why. You may say, well, what sources would you recommend, Tom? Well, it depends on what their other genetics are. So if they have an issue with phosphatidylcholine, I'm going to say you're going to need to get your saturated fat from egg yolks because you're going to want to get that phosphatidylcholine in your body because you have polymorphisms for that as well. So it all depends on what else they have going on. But you guys don't know. You don't, you, most of you don't know what's going on with your 23andMe results. But let me finish the conversation. Saturated fat polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat. Well, let's take a look at polyunsaturated fat. PUFAs. Now, go back to UTC 101. That's over 10 years ago at this point. It's 12 years ago where you heard me talking about omega-3 and omega-6s, both of which are polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFAs. PUFAs have, if you look into this further, Google it, we see that high PUFA um, consumption leads to heart disease. But guys, is it all PUFAs? Is it all of them? Is it all of them? No, guys, it turns out that because, and, and again, you heard me say this 12 years ago, and it's in my manual 12 years ago, that the issue is the ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s. That because we're pushing so much omega-6 into our body, those omega-6s are actually being stored in our body fat. And we see it. We see that, that those fats, linoleic acid, is being stored in our body fat 100, 200, 300% higher than it was just 50 years ago. And that is creating an issue in our bodies systemically that we're beginning to understand. Well, how do we fix that? Well, you have less omega-6s which is mostly your seed oils, and guess what? Soy. So when you're a, a vegetarian, you tend to eat a lot of omega-6s and not a lot of omega-3s, depending on where you get your omega-3s. Now, fish oil has a lot of omega-3s. So how do we balance this ratio? You obviously raise your omega-3s, right? And lower your omega-6s. Now, most fats have some combination of both. But the point is, is that that's one of the main reasons, going back literally since the day I opened the gym, that I recommend most people should be on a fish oil. You raise your omega-3s, then I have a whole conversation about why you need to do away with refined carbs and seed oils to lower your omega-6s. Because guess what? Refined carbs also have a lot of omega-6s. It's not just the sugar and, and the refined carbs that um, are combining to have issues with the saturated fat. It's also these omega-6s um, are very high in refined carbs as well, as well as seed oils. All right. So now you may be saying, well, gee, should I be getting more monounsaturated fat? Well, again, when it comes to PUFAs, you want to balance your ratio. Move your omega-6s down, you move your omega-3s up. 
When it comes to saturated fat, you want to make sure you're getting it from good organic sources and not the crappy sources that I talked about. When it comes to monounsaturated fat, you need it. You need about a third of each. That's a good place to start for the average person. Now, if you look at your 23, 23 me results, I may say, hey, look, you want to get more like 20, you know, 30 and 50, meaning 50 monounsaturated, 30 from poly, 20. You may say, well, how do you do that? It's actually not that hard if I show you where you're getting your fats from. Eat more of this, less of that. It's pretty simple. So I think the last thing I wanted to cover was, you know, are there, what other ways are there to lower your LDL? You know, if you do have an LDL problem, again, which is, which is also genetic, there are genetic issues with LDL. And again, should we fix that? Is there really an issue there if you're genetically high? Well, there's certain, again, we can break LDL down into other forms of LDL. And that's a whole nother thing. If you want to learn about that, Tom Dayspring is the man. Dr. Peter T and his podcast also interviews Tom Dayspring for five episodes. If you think MedCram is tough, good luck with those five episodes, but I listen to all of them. The, the bottom line is, is that there are things about LDL that are really, really huge topics. That's why there's five episodes, two hours each, just on LDL. But if you want to lower LDL, yeah, you can increase your fiber. You can increase your exercise. You can reduce your body weight. You can do all the things we've been talking about up here. All right. So guys, it's already past 20 minutes. I have so much more to say, but I hope that that gives you at least a little bit of an understanding that the, these topics are bigger than I have time for. That's why I run seminars. That's why I do this stuff over the course of lots of time. But that's also why it's so important to ask questions. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I don't really care. But if you give me a thumbs down, please give me a comment of why are you giving me a thumbs down? What is it that I failed to communicate here? So if you want to hear more about any specific thing, please let me know. And if you want to listen to um, that Joel Kahn, Chris Kresser debate, just go back to the day nine video, go into the description and you'll see that it's in there or just YouTube Joel Kresser and Chris, uh, Joel Rogan. <laughs> oh my goodness. Joel Kahn and Chris Kresser on Joe Rogan. All right, guys, have a great rest of the day. Please give me a thumbs up. Please share the video. I think you agree that the info is pretty important here. Thanks, guys.